Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. This is the only podcast in the world that hopes to take you out of the world. We'll explore the universe, find out all the sciencey secrets that are lurking inside, and then hopefully get you back home in about 25 minutes. Uh, this week, we will welcome our first ever starfish to the Dangerous Dan list. I, I know, who knew a starfish could be so brutal? We'll find out who it is in a little bit. Uh, also, we'll talk about a brand new dinosaur that's just been discovered in Australia. And I've got some of your questions to answer as always. Today, they're about blushing, about babies and about rose bushes. That's coming up first. Let's catch up with one of our favourite geniuses on the Science Weekly. This is Professor Hallux. Professor Hallux's Digital Dental Depository. With support from Philip Sonicare. What are you working on, Professor? You remember my dear old Uncle Halitosis? The dentist. That's right. It's nearly his 100th birthday. And in his honour, I'm creating a pop-up digital dental depository. An oral health help desk, if you like. I'm going to see how many questions all about teeth I can answer against the clock. Give us a hand, will you, Nanobot? Just needs winding up. Here you go. You can ask the questions. OK, first question. Why do we need to clean our teeth? Well, that's easy. The food and drink that you eat encourages germs called bacteria to grow in our mouths and on your teeth. Left to their own devices, this bacteria can form a soft yellow substance on your teeth. This is called plaque, and plaque can damage the surface of your teeth, eating away at the enamel, causing decay and toothache. Not forgetting gum disease. Or bad breath. Strong start, Professor. Next question. How often should you brush your teeth and for how long? You should brush your teeth after breakfast and after supper before you go to bed. Two minutes twice a day. To help make sure you're giving each tooth the best clean possible, most electric toothbrushes have a two-minute timer. And you need to remember to clean every part of your teeth. So that's brushing the inside surfaces, the outside surfaces, the chewing surfaces, and not forgetting the gaps between your teeth. It's a good idea to brush at a 45 degree angle to your teeth, starting at the gum line, and then using a gentle circular motion, move your brush up and down each tooth. Well done, you're doing grand. Oh. Tricky question, this one. True or false? You should rinse your mouth with water after brushing your teeth. Ha! A trick question. You might think you should rinse your mouth out after brushing your teeth, but you shouldn't. It'll only wash away the concentrated fluoride in any remaining toothpaste, reducing its preventative effects. Better hurry. Just a couple more to go. Mouthwash or not? Yep. Mouthwashes are helpful. Although make sure you use one which is appropriate for your age and choose one with fluoride. It can be a good idea to use mouthwash at a different time of the day to when you brush your teeth. So say use a mouthwash after lunch. But remember, don't eat or drink for 30 minutes after using a fluoride mouthwash or otherwise the benefits are washed away. Flossing. Give us the low down. Well, flossing isn't just for dislodging food wedged between your teeth. Regular flossing can help reduce the risk of gum disease and bad breath by removing plaque that forms along the gum line. There are loads of ways to floss, from dental tape and into dental brushes to the very latest technology where you use bursts of air and water or mouthwash to blast between the gaps. And did you know, it's best to floss before brushing your teeth. And finally, for a bonus point, what about toothpicks? Definitely avoid wooden toothpicks. They can splinter and cause damage to your gums. Time's up. Brilliant, Professor. A very respectable score there and lots of dental data for the Digital Dental Depository. Professor Halix's Digital Dental Depository, with support from Philip Sonicare. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Halix. Right, it's question time on the show. It's seriously my favourite part of the Science Weekly. It's when you turn me into a, like a science Sherlock. 
you send your questions in as a review for our podcast uh, on the Apple Podcast Store. Uh, then I have a look around, I do all the digging online, and I try and get you the answer. Uh, this is from Clara, who's in Sheffield, who asks, uh, Why do faces go red when we're embarrassed or we're hot? Now, they're both really for the same reason. Faces go red uh, because small blood vessels in your face called capillaries, they open out so more blood moves through them, which is why your face looks red. Now, it does this when you're hot to move heat that's all over the body while you're exercising to the surface of your skin, which makes it easier to cool down. Now, it's a similar reason why we go red when we're embarrassed. It's because we blush, because adrenaline is kicking in and your body goes into, into kind of fight or flight mode. So the vessels open up because they expect that you'll get really hot because you're either running away or you're charging after someone when really it's normally that you're just a little bit embarrassed. Thank you very much for that, Clara. This is from Izzy, uh, who asks, hmm, strange one this, bear with, can you have a baby in space? And if one was born on the International Space Station, what nationality would it be? What a great question. Um, the truth is, Izzy, I don't know. Uh, quite hard for me to figure out as well. <laughs> Interestingly, though, a company called Space Life Origin from the Netherlands does want to send a, a pregnant lady up into space to have a baby. Uh, they'll quickly take her up and take her down again when it's all done. Uh, they want to use this as an experiment in case humans can no longer live on Earth. They say, uh, quite rightly, uh, it's pretty pointless having to think about going to a new planet if we can't grow the species while we're there and we can't live on Earth. Now, there's a lot they need to figure out with this, so no one really knows a lot about gravity and about heart pumping and, and serious stuff like that. Uh, so that's the first one. And the last one about uh, what nationality would it be? According to the website Space Legal Issues, a baby born on the ISS would have the nationality of its parents. So that nicely covers that. Uh, thank you for that, Izzy. And lastly today from Turbo Tubo, great name, who asks, why do roses have sharp thorns? Uh, well, technically, Turbo, they're not thorns at all. Thorns are actually on uh, the flower, they're, they're, they're called prickles. I know everyone calls them thorns, so I'll let you off, but they're really called prickles, and they're there for a simple reason, to keep away predators. Roses are bright red, normally. Uh, they look delicious. Uh, they're like that to attract pollinators, bees, things like that. Uh, so the roses, they don't want deer or any other animal eating them because that will stop them spreading, so their stem is covered in sharp spikes. Uh, there we go. We covered it all today, didn't we? Uh, getting embarrassed, blushing, babies and roses. If you've got a question that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for me as a review. Find the Science Weekly on the Apple Podcast Store. There's a little comment box at the bottom. That's where you leave your question. And I will try and cover it for you next week. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, we've spoken a lot about plastic on the show over the few years. That How we change the way that we use plastic to try and save the planet. Uh, but if you're being honest with me... How often do you actually do anything? How often do you actually change anything? Now, our guests this week are two sisters who are actually acting on it. Their homeschool um, plastic project has become an award-winning charity, and they've just released a book about it. It's called Be Plastic Clever, and they're on the show to tell us more. Amy and Ella Meek, hello. Hi, Hi. thank you for having us. No, please, thank you for taking time out of... Uh, what must be the most busiest time for you? I mean, we're stuck at home right now. Uh, most people are kicking their heels, but I think you must be just extraordinarily busy. Ella, tell us a bit more about what you're doing right now. Well, at the moment in quarantine, we're still trying to keep up all of our work with the charity and that's doing work through anything that we can really. So that's joining lots of video calls with other young activists to keep everyone inspired, but also carrying on spreading our message to people who are also in quarantine and lockdown just to make sure that as soon as we leave, everyone can have something to do to start their activism straight away. And as I said at the start, this all came out of um, a home project that you were set from school, I think. Uh, Amy, can you tell us a bit more about what the project was and then how you were so inspired by that project you took it a little bit further than I imagine most school kids would? Yeah, well, actually, we weren't at school at that time. Um, we were homeschooled by our parents for about four years. And it was during this time that we, we started as part of our homeschool curriculum, it was called. Um, we started studied the UN's global goals for sustainable development and so we chose three of these goals to study and basically they're 17 massive 
global issues that are trying to be tackled by world leaders by 2030. And through these three goals that we chose, we saw a common thread of plastic pollution coming up. And to be honest, we were really shocked by that because at the time, this was back in early 2016, there wasn't really much out there about plastic. It wasn't really in the news much. It wasn't much of a hot topic. And yet um, it was a massive issue that was having huge impacts on wildlife and on the planet. So we basically thought, you know, once we found out about this, we can't turn a blind eye. We need to actually do something about that. And that's how Kids Against Plastic came about. So what did you actually do, Ella? Because most people, aside from apparently you two and Greta Thunberg, don't, you know, we have these ideals. We have these these things, how we want to change the world. But, you know, we don't really act on it. So you've got this massive dream of what you want to do. Uh, Ella, what was the first thing that you, you did do? How, how did you start trying to be plastic clever and, and, and teach us all about it? Well, we originally decided that we try and tackle this from, say, supermarkets and big companies and try and tell them to stop using so much plastic and stop selling so much plastic. And we quickly realised that we wouldn't be able to make as, as big of a change as we wanted to by doing this, because often when you approach these people, they just try and put it off to the next person and nothing ever actually happens. So we decided to try and bring about change through consumer demand. And that was by educating everyone else to do their bit and stop using single-use plastic items. And Plastic Clever is reducing our use of big four plastic items, which are single-use cups and lids, straws, bottles and bags. And that might seem like just stopping using these items won't make as big of a change as you want to make, but actually, if everyone did this, then it, it would make a huge difference because, you know, if, if we all do this action and then show that show these companies that we don't want to carry on using this plastic that they're selling then they'll have to make a change and it also is empowering for everyone to be able to do just their small bit without feeling like they aren't doing enough or they can't try and tackle this huge problem uh, you made the website kidsagainstplastic.co.uk how did you show uh, all the other kids everyone else that this was actually quite easy to do how did you how did you encourage them and how did you get them to come along on the ride and adventure with you? Well, I think the key thing that we try and promote through Kids Against Plastic is that if you want to do something to tackle plastic or any problem, really, whether it's environmental or uh, one of the other issues that are affecting our planet, you know, the important thing to do is just to start small because it's really hard to take huge steps and go completely plastic free or something similar. So actually what we promote to kids and adults alike really is that if you just start small, that will make a big difference, like Ella said. And also what we also try and tell young people is that, you know, we were 10 and 12 when we started Kids Against Plastic. And so really there's no barrier to how old you have to be to get involved in activism. You can be any age and actually young people have a really powerful voice. And we've seen this through the work that Greta's done in particular. You know, when we stand up for something that we believe in, we can have a really, really powerful impact. So that's something that we definitely try and get across through our work because, you know, our charity is called Kids Against Plastic for a reason. We don't want it to just be us <laughs> tackling this issue. We want as many young people to get involved as well because we can have a big difference, especially when we work together. Now, this is a massive project to try and crack on with when you're kind of just starting out in secondary school. What was the toughest part of starting the campaign, Ella? So the fact that people weren't aware of how big this problem was and all of the effects of single-use plastic on the environment definitely made it a bit more difficult to bring about change. But as the years have gone on and there's more awareness around the issue of plastic pollution, we found it easier to inspire people to actually make a change in their lives because they know about <laughs> this huge problem and they, they probably don't want it to carry on the way it is. So now there is this more, more of awareness around it, it's definitely been easier to get people to make a change in their lives. And the merch that we can buy for this is amazing. So you've got badges on there, you've got hats, you've got coffee cups, you've got the, also the, the most like brilliant baseball kind of t-shirts on there. They, they look amazing. Uh, and there's also the book, the brand new one, Be Plastic Clever. When you found out that you were going to make a book based on your charity and your project, how, how did you go about taking this big idea and actually putting it down into words that we want to read? 
Well, the book and Kids Against Plastic have got a lot of overlap happening because Be Plastic Cover really encompasses a lot of what Kids Against Plastic is about and it's sort of putting the ideas down that we talk about and that we try and promote into words so that people can pick up a book and hopefully use it to make a change in their everyday life. And we, we really wanted this book to be something that didn't just... I don't know, get read once or even not get read properly at all and then just go and sit on the shelf. We wanted it to be one that was actually useful and quite fun to read. So that's why it's it's really putting what Kids Against Plastic's about into the book. So it's got information on plastic to help you find out more and it's presented in a really illustrated way so that it's a really fun read as well. And then it's also got some clear steps on how you can be an activist and how you can reduce plastic as well. So the idea was that it was something that went really hand in hand with Kids Against Plastic and was hopefully a useful guide that you can pick up and use out and about as well. It's got a forward by uh, Steve Backshall. We love Steve Backshall. Uh, a couple of diary entries from you as well. As you say, there's loads of tips on there as well. Uh, it, it, it's really thorough on how we can we can try and stop using single use plastics. Um, um, Ella, can you just very, I don't want you to give away all the tips that you've got in the book, but I know there are a lot of people worried about plastic. We talk about it a lot on the show. What are some really key simple things that, that we can do at home to, to try and help things out? Well, the big thing that we suggest everyone does is go plastic clever. And that's the idea that we came up with, because often being plastic free and starting like that can be demoralising if you can't achieve it, because it is very difficult to to achieve. So we suggest that people go plastic clever instead, which is, like I said before, reducing the use of the big four plastic items, cups and lids, straws, bottles and bags. And the easiest way to do that is replacing them with reusable items that then you can go on and use when you're out and about instead of having to use single use items. And that's one of the big tips that we suggest that everyone can do. And it is simple to, to achieve, but can make a bigger difference than you think. Another thing is believing in yourself, because we might be young kids, but we can all ha make a difference. And as the future generation, we should be listened to by adults and politicians so that we actually can make a change. So definitely don't let anything hold you back. If it's your age, your gender, where you're from, anything, because everyone can make a difference. And it's just about believing in yourself and having the passion to do it. I think finally, let me just run through uh, your kind of CV so far, which is ridiculous because you're so young. <laughs> uh, you've picked up apparently more than 60,000 pieces of, of plastic litter. You've done your own TEDx talk. Uh, you've spoken at the Houses of Parliament, at the UN. You've made this campaign. Um, you go to school as well. Now you've got a book out. Uh, Amy, what is, there, what is there left that you would like to do? Uh, where can you take this campaign uh, what do you want to do with it when you're a little bit older? H how else are you going to carry on being an activist? Well, that's a really good question because, you know, as you just said, we've had some incredible opportunities as uh, part of Kids Against Plastic that we could never have dreamed of. And I think being an activist, you know, you never really know what's around the corner. Each year brings new opportunities that you could never have expected. I think in terms of looking to the future with Kids Against Plastic, we would definitely like to get more kids involved um so if they're some of your listeners um we're always going to be encouraging other young people to get involved with kids against plastic or even to take action on different issues if it's not plastic that um, they're passionate about that doesn't matter you know the important thing is actually believing that our youth voice can make a difference and if we can support any young people in doing that then that is something we're definitely looking to do and i can definitely see myself carrying on doing this long into the future because i don't think i can leave this activist lifestyle behind now we all need something to do while we're stuck at home. Maybe over the next month or so, we should kind of organise a big, maybe not too soon because the rules are still quite tight, but maybe in a few months' time, we, we should like make some massive thing where we all kind of go out on a day and we pick up litter near where we are. That's an idea. Leave it with me. We can all be plastic clever together. Um, I'm serious. Uh, anyway, while I crack on with that, uh, I leave everyone like full encouragement. I push you towards the book. It's brilliant. It's called Be Plastic Clever. Uh, it's by Amy and Ella Meek. Uh, thank you so much, girls, for coming on the show. Thank you thank for you having, having us. It's been great. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan, where I think we are welcoming our first ever starfish onto the list. Who knew a starfish could be brutal? It's called the Crown of Thorns Starfish, and it looks 
beautiful, but kind of terrifying at the same time, I'll be honest. They're brightly coloured with thick starfish arms, loads of them as well, I think around 20 that are covered in long, thin spikes. They look kind of like a cactus in the sea, and they feast on coral. They're coral reef killers doing serious damage all over the world. Uh, The problem is they've rocketed in numbers over the past 30 years, mainly due to humans overfishing their predators. So no one is eating them, which means that they are eating more of the stunning coral. You find them mostly around uh, Australia, uh, Australian waters. Now their spikes can be covered in toxic poison, which can break off and it can get stuck in the flesh that they pierce. They're not usually deadly to humans, but it causes a huge stinging pain. Uh, It can make you bleed for a week. Uh, So it's mainly their threat to the environment why they're on this list. They're dangerous, Dan, because they're dangerous to coral. So dangerous that scientists have to go down into the ocean to try and kill the crown of thorns starfish just to stop them killing the coral. Right, it's time for another episode of our brand new podcast series, Thunderbirds Are Go, Mission to Mars. We've had a few of these now. In every single one, we've got KO and Brains from the actual Thunderbirds from International Rescue. Uh, They're coming down here to take me and you as well on a trip to the Red Planet. Thunderbirds Are Go, Mission to Mars. I'm here with the Thunderbirds team on Tracy Island, no less, finding out all about the ExoMars mission, and I still can't quite believe I'm here. It's nice to have you. Do you know, I think you might be the only person to be invited to Tracy Island who isn't part of International Rescue. That's even more awesome. Now, you guys here at International Rescue have some amazing vehicles and machines to help out, don't you? That's right. We're lucky that we have a vehicle for almost every job, whether up in the sky, under the water, or speeding across terrain. And all of them created by brains. But I have to say, the ExoMars mission has a pretty cool vehicle of its own, the Rover, which looks like it's the star of the show. I quite agree, Dan. Why don't you let me introduce you? The Rosalind Franklin Rover named after an English chemist and DNA pioneer. Shall we have a closer look? The rover weighs around 700 pounds and stands two and a half meters tall. It kind of reminds me of someone. I couldn't agree more. If you're thinking of Max, of course, my robotic assistant. (laughs) Max certainly has a few things in common with Rosalind. In fact, I think they would get along. Both can power themselves. Max has an internal power pack, while Rosalind generates her power through solar panels. Max has optical scanners to see what's around. And Rosalind creates digital maps from navigation stereo cameras that help to plan her routes. She's also kitted out with some close-up collision avoidance cameras to help keep her safe and avoid any... It looks like Rosalind's got fairly big wheels. That's a bit different to you, Max. You've got legs. Does that mean Rosalind just rolls with it? Not so different. Max has adaptable all-terrain mobility limbs. I suppose you could say they look a little bit like legs. But each one of his limbs has wheels to roll along. Rosalind's got six wheels. Whilst they're located in Pepe's, Each wheel can be independently steered and driven. So in a way, she can almost walk. That sort of control is going to be critical when crossing sandy dunes. And amazing as Max is, Rosalind certainly got a few tricks in her box. She's equipped with a two-metre drill that will be used to collect samples and a whole array of instruments to test samples. Let's have a closer look. When she's collected samples using her to drill, They will be delivered to a small but powerful analytical laboratory in the heart of the rover, where samples will be crushed into a fine powder and placed into the different instruments to be analysed. But how will we get the results from those tests? I mean, I'm guessing it's going to be pretty hard getting her back to Earth. There's no plan for Rosalind to ever come back to Earth. She will communicate with scientists on Earth and send the results of her tests from Mars. 
those scientists will also be able to send her new instructions. But because of the orbits of the Earth and Mars, that can only happen twice a day. So we can sort of talk to her and she can talk back. Gotta say, she might be a little bit easier to understand than you, Max. Well, I understand M Max perfectly. Isn't that right? And he understands you, Brains. So he must be pretty special too. Thunderbirds are go. Mission to Mars. With support from the UK Space Agency and International Rescue. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, the British Science Association has found out that almost 90% of young people feel that scientists and politicians are leaving them out of the conversation around COVID-19. They're losing trust. And on this show, we simply cannot have people lose trust in science. So to help us sort this all out, we've got Catherine Matheson, who is the CEO of the British Science Association, on the line to help us. Hey, Catherine. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, uh, let's start. Where do you think this this originally comes from? What, why are we feeling left out at the moment? Well, the survey we did asked people who they thought, you know, when you see um, government officials or scientists in the media talking to, trying to talk to the public, we asked young people who they think they're talking about. Are they talking to you? And the young people that we spoke to, they said, no, it feels like those conversations are not for us. They're not aimed at us. We're not supposed to be in them. We're not supposed to be part of them. And I think maybe, um, you know, maybe because of the focus has been on trying to get people to listen to the advice, maybe because children seem children and young people seem less affected by COVID-19 as a disease in terms of their own health. I don't know. I think, I think children and young people just got left out of the conversation. And I don't think scientists and government officials meant to do that. Of course they didn't. Um, they just got kind of, um, I think, stuck into trying to tell as many people on, on the news as possible <laughs> and, um, and, and forgot about what it's like to be on the listening side of that conversation. Should kids be bothered, be bothered though? Uh, because if, if, if some of them are feeling left out, but as you say, um, it, it's not affecting them at all as much as it's affecting uh other uh, other generations is, is there a do we, do we mind well i mean it's true to say that covid19 as a disease is less likely to affect uh, young people's health compared to older people's health but i don't think it's at all true to say young people are unaffected by the pandemic i think um you know what happened to school what happened to exams what happened to going out to play with your friends what happened to going on holiday going to the going to the cinema you know all of these things have been massively affected. And I think for young people, it's it's often, it's a rather anxious time. It's a strange time. Um, and so it is absolutely true that they're affected by the measures that have been taken to try and contain the virus. Although they might not be affected by the virus directly, they're affected in other ways. And sometimes, you know, some young people have family members who are severely affected or are having to be very careful about what they do day to day to avoid um, being exposed to the virus. So I think young people are affected. And I think that is one very good reason why scientists and government officials should be talking to them directly. But also, I think that this, um, you know, this problem is not going to go away overnight. You know, we are going, society is going to change a lot. There's a huge amount of research going on at the moment to try and find ways that we can help defeat the virus or at least live with it better. Um, and young people are as much a part of that um, part of that effort as anybody else. So uh, young people might be thinking about what uh, you know what their future career moves are, or what research they can do now um, while they're um, while they're at home, or once they go back to school. Um, I think that to say, oh, just because you're you know you're still at school, you don't have a part in this effort is just wrong. We know already that young people can contribute to research, um, and that they can be part of making society a better place. In fact, some of the people who change society the most are often still at school. Greta Thunberg is a great example. Um, and so I think it is imperative. It's really, really important that we involve young people in this conversation right now. What is the first stage in that then? If someone listening right now maybe is feeling a little bit isolated by scientists and politicians, but, but still thinks that perhaps they can change the world like, like, like Greta has on a big scale or maybe on a, on a much smaller scale, what would you advise is the first stage of that? What can they do to just 
may, maybe try and help things out around the home? Yeah, sure. So I think young people should feel um, able to ask to scientists and government officials their questions. So um, they are just as accountable, scientists and government officials are just as accountable to young people as to everybody else. And so if you see a scientist, maybe you see them on Twitter or Instagram or on the TV or whatever it is, um, you should be able to ask them the questions that you have. And most, I mean, I know a lot of scientists and they're usually really happy to answer people's questions. They're usually really delighted when somebody asks them a question about their research. So um, I think young people should feel like, oh, I can ask the scientists the questions that I have. And the same for government officials. So they may not, they may be... Um, Busy, super busy at the moment they might not be able to answer all of the questions but it's certainly worth asking them because until we until we show what the questions are then they are they won't know what young people's concerns are um i know that there's a lot of schools and community groups and youth groups um trying to support the young people in their areas and so that might be a way of getting together with other young people um and saying actually we've got you know we're worried about this we want you know a local we want to speak to a local um researcher or a local doctor or an mp or whoever it might be to find out more and to have our concerns listened to. And certainly organisations like ours, the British Science Association and lots of other science organisations are really keen to involve more young people in the conversation. So we're going to be trying really hard to use our social media channels, for example, to listen to what young people are trying to tell us. It must be quite a hard task, though, for you to, to just try and go on, on social media and, and be like, hey, what, what's... What's concerning you? What are the issues? What are you thinking? How are you how are you going to try and do that to make sure that loads of kids are covered? Yeah, well, I mean, social media is fantastic, isn't it, for finding out what people think. But still, we don't always tell exactly the truth on social media. Maybe we say what we think um, people are supposed to say. Um, and so I think it is one way of... Um, of having a conversation. And I think the other ways of having a conversation, whether it's with our families at home or with our... Um, you know, teachers or youth leaders or whoever it might be, they're just as important because sometimes those conversations are where we feel that we can open up a bit more. Um, and so uh, my, my call to young people really is to start having those conversations more and more. We know that lots of young people, uh, when we when we talk to the young people, we found that more and more of them um, were turning to their families to ask questions, that people really trust their families, um, maybe more than they do scientists. Um and, you know, lots of young people said, I want to hear more from my family about the virus. And for some families, that might be great. They might have, um, the, uh, they might be able to have that conversation with you. But um, some families are really busy, <laughs> you know, trying to go to work and do the shopping and do everything else. So um, uh, for young people who perhaps don't have families who have lots of time for those conversations, maybe we need to turn to teachers and youth leaders a little bit more. Well, there you go. Thank you so much for... Uh, for giving us some confidence with this, Catherine. If, if you're listening to this and if you are worried, if you're one of those 90% who feels isolated and left out by scientists and politicians, I mean, they've got a lot of work on. Let's yeah. just start. Scientists and politicians, they're very, very busy right now, um, but that doesn't mean they don't need to include you. So if you feel you are being left out, please do ask them questions. Um, and the, the British Science Association are, are going to try and help you do that. Catherine Matheson, thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thanks, Dan. Let's get cracking with this week's Science in the News. A rare toothless dinosaur fossil has been found in Australia. It's identified as being from an alephrosaur, which means light-footed lizard, and it's the largest alephrosaur, alephrosaur bone that's been found in Australia. They had long necks, stumpy arms, small hands. They were about two metres long with no teeth. Also, scientists have made a surprising discovery about Mars by playing with mud in the lab. It seems that on the red planet, volcanoes spit mud instead of lava, and they wondered how it looks. So they've done experiments, and they've seen that Martian mud flows a bit like boiling toothpaste, uh, and even bounces sometimes as well. And finally, the US Air Force successfully launched its Atlas V rocket carrying a space plane, uh, a space plane, sorry, for a secret mission. The aircraft uh, will put a satellite into the Earth's orbit. Uh, it will test power beaming technology as well. The problem is people know very little about what it will do while it's up there. Thank you. 
And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for giving us a listen. You can hear all of our brilliant uh, podcast series, some that you heard today, Professor Hallock's The Thunderbirds one. We've got loads more for you. Uh, wherever you get your podcasts from, you can also find them on the free Fun Kids app, and they're at funkidslive.com. If the place where you find your podcasts, by the way, uh, is the Apple Podcast Store, uh, leave us a review and write your science question in there. Drop your name as well so I know who you are, so I can say hello. Five stars will really help me see it. And then I'll become a science Sherlock and I'll do the digging for you. If you're not on Apple Podcasts, uh, fire it over to my page at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all around the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app. And as always, at funkidslive.com, 